Chapter 4, Molecular Structures and Orbitals. So we have in the previous class and in the previous chapter learned about how atoms come together to form bonds. So we've linked up two atoms together. Now we're going to take a couple of atoms. We've learned how to do that with a 2D structure, with our Lewis structures and our Lewis diagrams. We talked about resonance and formal charge. And we got these things, but they haven't popped up off the page. And molecules exist in all three dimensions. And that physical shape oftentimes matters for the behavior chemically and the behavior biologically of these molecules. DNA, for example, wouldn't work if it was flat. So here is our chapter breakdown. We're going to go through molecular structure. We'll talk about the Vesper model. Uh, that's going to give us our 3D shape. We're going to talk about bond polarity and dipole moments. We'll talk about hybridization and the localized electron model, sometimes called the valence bond model. Then we'll do the molecular orbital model, and we'll look at that in bonding in a homonucle homonuclear diatomic molecules, in heteronuclear diatomic molecules, and then we'll combine the localized electron and molecular orbital models in 4.7. To review, we talked about three types or models of chemical bonding. The first was ionic bonding, which is an uneven, vastly uneven. You can think of it as almost taking an electron. So ionic bonding is between uh, something that's going to act like a cation and something that's going to act like an anion. You can think of forces of attraction between that plus charge and the minus charge. And these things will assemble into ionic solids. They tend to be brittle, non-conducting in the solid form. Uh, sodium chloride, that's your go-to ionic compound. That bond is a very uneven one. An electron almost completely spends its time around one atom uh, after being donated by another. So sodium here gives up an electron to chlorine. Chlorine accepts the electron, becomes negative. Many of these sodium chloride units repeat to make a large uh, compound of sodium chloride. Then we talked about covalent bonding. And a lot of molecular structures, something like sugar, DNA, uh, use covalent bonding instead. These tend to have lower melting points. Uh, they tend to, they can or cannot conduct. Uh, you can have these as polar or nonpolar. Uh, you can combine, for example, chlorine and bromine together. They have similar electronegativities. And so the electrons are going to be shared more evenly. If it's completely even sharing of electrons, then we call that a nonpolar covalent bond. If the electrons are shared disproportionately, one of them has the electron a little bit more than the other, we'll call that a polar covalent bond. Um, and then third, we talked a little bit about metallic bonding. So you got many atoms, and the electrons are completely delocalized and free to move around that atom. That's how electrical conduction works, is that one electron over here bumps into another, which causes, you know, basically causes like a wave almost of these electrons to go through and transmit that energy. Uh, what holds the particles in a compound together? That is sharing electrons, right? We can do that as an ionic bond between positive and negative. Uh, there's no such thing as a purely ionic bond. Right? Remember, you've got to have some electron density surrounding this cation, even though it has basically given up most of its, anion, or most of its electron to the anion. Uh, and then we've got covalent bonds, which is a more even sharing of the electrons between two atom centers. We said that covalent bond results from the sharing of those electrons. And a molecule is the unit of matter that is held together by covalent bonds. And we're going to go through a couple of examples so that you can kind of build up a paradigm for what, what do we mean by a molecule versus a compound versus because something else. Because we're going to need that when we start talking about uh, stoichiometry and doing mass to mole conversions and figuring out, well, what's going to happen in a chemical reaction. So. Um, we need to know if something is a molecule or whether it's got a formula unit or whether it's got a molecular unit. So let's look at some examples. So uh, our first one up is sodium chloride. So is sodium chloride going to exist as a molecule, right? We know sodium chloride crystals pretty well. Uh, we sprinkle them on our food because we like to eat minerals. Is it a molecule? NaCl molecule? No. It's Unless it's an isolated NaCl unit, sodium chloride, this is a 
repeating fraction that's going to be a formula unit. It is not by itself a molecule, right? It's not going to exist by itself, right? You're going to have many of these things repeated over and over again. Sodium plus, is it a molecule? No, right? There is no bonding going on. It is not a molecule. Nitrate ion, NO3 minus, is it a molecule? Yes, because it's got atoms that are bound together into a discrete unit. Hydrogen gas, H2, is it a molecule? Yes, it has atoms bound together. They're traveling alone together as one unit. Helium gas, is it a molecule? Yes, right? Even though it doesn't have atoms that are bound together, it is still a discrete unit. The same thing would happen with any of your other noble gases as well. Uh, a diamond. Is it a molecule? So I go to pick up a diamond on somebody's ring, and I'm like, it's in a molecule, and the answer is no, ish. Um, it is a covalent network solid, so it's kind of like our sodium chloride, where we're not really going to be able to call it a molecule, uh, even though it, it's got bonding in it between multiple atoms, because you can't just say, oh, here's a diamond, and this is the molar mass for a diamond. Uh, it's it's not going to really be a molecule. Uh, a buckyball, a C60 nanosphere, that's one of these guys over here. Yeah, it's a molecule. It's got atoms bound together, and it is a discrete unit. So it's discrete unit and atoms bound together most of the time is what's going to make something a molecule. Right? That's one of those keys. So now let's take a look at our VESPER model. That stands for uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion. So our molecular structure is the three-dimensional arrangement of atoms in a molecule. Uh, VESPER is a tool we're going to use to give us an idea of what those molecular shapes are going to be. And the rules are pretty simple. The structure around a given atom is determined principally by minimizing electron pair repulsions. Electrons have a negative charge. They do not want to be next to an electron. Atoms are surrounded by electrons. Right? They're kind of drawing those electrons in around that positive center, but the outside shell of an atom is still an electron. It's got a negative charge. They don't want to be around other electrons. They don't want to be around lone pairs of electrons, and they don't want to be around other atoms. So we want to minimize the forces of repulsion, and the molecule is going to move. It's going to adjust its geometry to minimize those forces of repulsion between atoms, which are shelled with negative electrons on the outside, and lone pairs of electrons on an atom. So electrons in these bonds and in lone pairs, we can think of these as charge clouds that repel one another and they stay as far apart as possible. This is going to cause molecules to assume specific shapes. And we're going to find out that there's only, based on the laws of geometry, a certain number of shapes that these guys are going to form. And then there's going to be some varieties on there that's going to give us pretty much the basics for all of our molecular shapes. Working from our electron dot structure, or Lewis structure, we can count the number of charged clouds and then determine the molecular shape. Each group of valence electrons around a central atom is located as far away as possible from the others in order to minimize repulsions. I mean, it says maximize, your publisher is wrong. The repulsions maximize the space that each object attached to the central atom occupies. So you want to maximize space, minimize repulsions. The result is five electron group arrangements of minimum energy that are going to be seen in a large majority of molecules and polyatomic ions. So we're going to get five basic electron groups, right? So it doesn't matter what's around our central atom, whether it's a lone pair, a single bond, a double bond, right? We're going to count all those things as a thing, a charge cloud, and we're going to arrange you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, we're going to arrange those things, and we're going to get five basic geometries. From those basic geometries, we're going to get some other subsets. Uh, the electron groups are the defining objects in this arrangement, but the molecular shape is going to be defined by the relative positions of the atomic nuclei, right? So you might have four electron clouds, right? One, two, one or two lone pairs, and then maybe two atoms, right, or two bonds, you're, you're going to have a different atomic shape, a molecular shape, than you'll have an electron domain geometry. And we'll clarify that in, a, in just a second.
Because our valence electrons can be bonding or non-bonding, the same electron group arrangement can give rise to different molecular shapes. Right? Molecular shapes, just looking at the atoms. Electron domain geometry is all the things, atoms and lone pairs. Right? Um, you can sometimes see this X formalism, uh, where you've got A as the central atom and X as a surrounding atom, and you can have a certain number of those, and then E as uh, the number of val non-bonding valence electrons, those are electron pairs, and N and M are integers that just count them. So it's a way to help organize this. There are other abbreviations that are basically the same thing. Uh, they don't necessarily use X, like they might be like AM, P, or something like an AMP one, but there's different varieties that just help categorize things into which five electron group you're going to be in, or which of the five electron groups you're going to be in, and then which molecular shape you're going to be in. So our rules are that electron pairs get as far apart from each other as possible. Right? One electron sees another electron and is like, ew, I don't want to hang out with you. So here's our strategy. We're going to start with our Lewis structure. From our Lewis structure, we're going to look at that central atom and we'll figure out how many things are attached to it, right? whether they be lone pairs, whether they be single bonds, whether they be double bonds. We're just going to count up the things that are around our central atom. From there, we will look at the number of other atoms to determine our electron ge geometry. So our electron domain can be a lone pair, a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond. Right? It's just things. Right? And what we will see is that we're going to end up with five basic geometries. Right? I can have a central atom with two things on it that's going to make a linear electron domain geometry. I can have a central atom with one, two, three things on it. It's going to form a trigonal planar electron domain geometry. Four things will be a tetrahedral electron domain geometry. If we have five things, we're going to end up with a trigonal bipyramidal electron ge domain geometry. If we have uh, six things, it'll be an octahedral electron domain geometry. And if we've got, uh, we add another one, we'll end up with a a pentagonal bipyramidal structure. You know, after that, we're just going to start adding things around the middle here. So these guys look like little jacks or tops, and we're just going to add stuff around the equator. Uh, one of the things that always bothered me about science shows, even when I was little, was that here's the Enterprise surrounded by uh, three Klingon warships. And I'm like, dude, you are in space. You have up and down to work with. So if you want to surround something in space and evenly distribute something in three dimensions uh, and, and surround a central thing in three dimensions, you're going to need four spaceships and be in a tetrahedral geometry because you can always just go up. 